Welcome, Impactful Parents. It's time for the Impactful Parenting Podcast, where I give you parenting tips and resources to make you a more impactful parent to your school-age child. I am your host, Christina Campos. Welcome, Impactful Parents. Today, we're going to be talking about co-parents that drive us crazy. And we're going to be talking about the unfairness, the bickering, and how your ex is always trying to get one up on you. Hello, my name is Christina Campos. I'm founder of The Impactful Parent, and I help parents of school-age children to turn their chaos into connection with their adolescent. I'm a mom of four kids, a teacher that's taught every grade from preschool through high school, and today I help moms and dads like yourself to navigate that exhausting, confusing, frustrating, but rewarding world of parenting. So welcome to The Impactful Parent. And today I have my co-host with me, Rodrigo Bravo. Rodrigo is a co-parenting mediator out of the state of Texas. He is a parenting coach, and most importantly, he is a dad of two boys. Rodrigo brings a dad's perspective onto the Impactful Parent stage to give you even more expertise and an added perspective on our parenting topics. So thank you for being here, Rodrigo. I am excited to talk about the conflicts of co-parenting with you. Rodrigo, both of us are divorced (laughs) and both of us have our exes. I know that for me, um, I was married for 13 years and my divorce is not anywhere close to being anything normal or traditional or anything like that. And neither is our co-parenting relationship. But tell me a little bit about where you and your co-parents stand. Uh, Both of our boys have different moms. And so I had different experiences with both of them. I've, that's kind of one of the tenets of why I became a co-parenting coach and consultant. Um, on one hand, Samuel's mom, her name is Maribel. We were pretty flexible with everything. Uh, we, we didn't really argue too much about uh, clothes and all this. We both respected each other's needs and wants and so forth. If anything, she would ask me for, hey, You know, Samuel's got school supplies. You want to go half on it. And most of the time, I would just pay for the whole thing, you know, or at least half. Uh, New clothes, shoes, whatever the case may be, haircuts. I was always very much pro. Okay, now you're bragging, Rodrigo. (laughs) No, no, no. But see, see, that was one relationship. That was Samuel's relationship and Samuel's mom's relationship. Now, when we're talking about Rodrigo's mom, it was completely different, Um, especially at the beginning, but even towards the end. Uh, that one was always a tit for tat, super petty, uh, uh, both, both parts at the beginning, you know, I mean, I'm talking about like a shirt, you know, and, and, um, like I like certain types of clothes. Right. And so I would go over there and and my son would go back home with his nice clothes on or whatever. And then, Hey, I need those clothes back and this and that, or he would come to my house with school uniforms on, Hey, I need those uniforms back. And it was always a constant. Hey, you know, he left his crayons, you know, hey, he left the book over there. Uh, hey, can I get this back? And and because she and I did not settle our emotional rifts, you know, what we were going through, it carried out into that. And it really hampered the communication between she and I and made a, a difficult relationship even worse. And so my, my you know, when, when she and I, Really, when I started kind of going through my mental health journey and making sure that I was going doing right, uh, that's when I started to shift my perspective. And e- even though she didn't, I started to just kind of like let those things go. They just weren't worth it. And so I think it's really important for for folks when they view this video and when they hear us, you know, kind of talk about the exchanges and all this that it is a growth. It it does take time to get to that spot, but you really need to work on yourself first and then the relationship with your co-parent, because if you don't do it that way, then the ones that really kind of suffer are the kids. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And like I said, my divorce is nothing traditional. We are completely like off the grid with how we do things, how we divided stuff, everything. And because of that, It is not equal. And I know that would drive a lot of people crazy. Um, It did and drive me crazy and has and still does from time to time. However, 
when you talk about that growth journey, I mean, immediately when I was going to get divorced, I had to start that growth journey and I knew it. Otherwise, it was going to plague me like a cancer. I was going to get bitter inside. I was going to get ugly and I didn't want that for myself. And I think that was the key. I didn't want that for myself. Like, I think sometimes we just react so often to our co-parent that we're not thinking about the person we actually want to be in that relationship anymore. We're just reactive because, well, they pull reaction out of us, I'll have to be honest with you. You know, you know how to push our buttons like nobody else can in this world. So uh, I had to really sit down and start working on that immediately. And I'm so grateful that I did. But it could go bad. And it does go bad for so many people. We even have a video to kind of give an example of what Rodrigo and I are talking about with this bickering and nitpicking. And uh, it's just a really great example that Rodrigo found. Let's go ahead and play it. Hey, hey, where's your uniform at? Mom said you need to buy our own uniforms for your house. Go, go back in there and tell her you guys need to get your uniform on, please. I gotta go to work. Mom, lock the door. Bye, Dad. No, 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 no. Today's your mama's day, not my responsibility to make y'all lunch. That's hers. She didn't buy those shoes, take them off. You're going out there barefoot today, son. All right? Look what it is. Here you go. There you go. She can get y'all your own backpack. It ain't my fault. She want to play. We going to play, play. Okay? Don't look sad, son. If you're sad, be sad at your mama. Not my fault. Your mama started this. I'm just finishing it. Okay? Love you guys. Have a great day at school. So, yeah. So, so I know that that's a skit. I know that, you know, it's kind of like they're playing around and so forth, right? But this is very true, very real. And you can even tell by the comments. If folks find the original video, you can tell by the comments that people play this out. They are actually out there having these type of arguments. And basically the video is detailing where the parents obviously have a rift. Obviously, there's kind of a discrepancy there between the parents like saying, hey, Who's got what? I want my back, you know, th this and that. And um, and this happens so often in co-parenting relationships. Um, I'm working with one client right now, just started, and that was one of the very first arguments. You know, uh, my daughter goes over there, and then he, he doesn't even bring the uniform back. You know, and, 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 and I get it. You know, I'm not here to criticize people or judge people or anything like that. But they had this argument in front of their child, and all of their child is seeing is mom and dad bickering, you know. And, and how much is a uniform? I, I don't. I don't know now. I know when I when I was Samuel wore uniforms, they were roughly like fifteen to twenty bucks, you know, the whole little set that he had. And when we come down to think about it, you know, we're, we're arguing about twenty bucks. To some people, that's a lot, and I totally get that. You know, I, I've been there. I've been there with twenty bucks meant something, right? But but twenty bucks and expense of your child watching, and getting further traumatized and seeing her parents argue, be petty and not display good communication skills, I think the cost is way more, in the long run, to your child. And I think this video kind of shows, even though it's a little exaggerated, but still it's a skit. But but this is a basis of reality, of how some parents are pretty petty and still have not come to terms with whatever it is that they have to resort to exerting power on items like that. I, I don't, is that the vibe you got, Christina, when you saw the video? Oh, yeah. And I thought it was hilarious. And the reason it's funny is because it's rooted in some truth, right? Like, we all can relate to that as a divorcee <laughs> and say, Oh yeah, that drives me crazy when I buy something and then I never get to see it again because it ends up at the ex's house and you don't go over there and you can't, it's hard to get the kids to rely on bringing stuff back and then they don't co op I mean, it's common, right? And so I, I did love the video that it made of not funny situation kind of funny. But what I, shocked me the most was what you said, the comments in the... Um, from the original video you go through the comments and and people they're not really laughing they're agreeing they're like yeah that's me and i'm like oh no 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 you're not you're missing it like it's a 
we're not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be ironic. <laughs> like, like you're supposed to see the video and go, oh, wow, I guess that is ridiculous. Um, yeah, that's that was the sentiment that you're supposed to get out of it. But instead, there's just parents identifying with it and saying, yeah, they need to bring that, you know, they have to bring it back. They have to. And so it's both. And I one word that you said that really struck out to me was communication, right? Now, bad communication is a huge trigger of conflict, especially with co-parenting relationships. But you, as a mediator, deal with this all the time. And I'm curious, what kind of communication conflicts do you see a lot in your practice that you see parents just, they, they can't get over it? Oh, yeah, there's a ton. And, 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 and really, it starts with emotion. When you have a breakup, there's a lot of emotions going on. Um, uh, what I see a lot of, and this is anecdotal, I don't have any scientific basis for it, but based on the clients that I've worked with, usually you'll have one person in the relationship that's on one emotional level. And you have another person in the relationship that's on another emotional level. What does that mean? That means one person may have already checked out of the relationship a long time ago. They're ready to move on. I'm talking about like they cut the reins. They're ready to go out there. They're ready to go date. They're excited. They're, 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 they've got plans to move on, break on. Meanwhile, the other co-parent is still reeling from the loss of their love. You know, that's real emotion. That's not that's not something you could just tell somebody, hey, you know what? Uh, get over it. Now you got to raise your kids and this and that. So, so a lot of times when there's separation, there's a lot of emotions. That was just one example. There's a lot of other examples where emotions are still going. They're still reeling, et cetera. So I think the most important thing that you can do is really get the get those lines of communication out and get those emotions out. One thing that I always tell my clients is that you have to vent in order to re, in order to reinvent. So again, you have to vent in order to reinvent. What does that mean? That means that when we have these emotions inside of us, when we have these feelings and we feel we haven't been heard many times in my mediation practice, maybe two or three meetings into it. I tell the I tell my I tell my clients I go what do you have that you want to say right now you know you don't want to start with that I don't start with that because usually both clients are not not in that space right but once we get to a point where we can actually talk where we're going to be listening you know I I kind of go into that space and I say hey look this is not an apology session this is not like hey you know uh, uh, this is just listen to me that's it acknowledge it. And that's it. You don't have to agree. You don't have to just hear me out so you can understand where I'm coming from when it comes to the, and I call it negotiations because that's really what it is, but these compromises that you have to make as co-parents. And, and most of the time I've had tremendous success with folks that just express themselves. They get it out there and the other parent acknowledges it and just says, I understand. And it gives those two people a good base to start off. It doesn't mean that like one person apologizes and accepts responsibility. I'm not here for that. I'm just here for you to listen. So we both understand where we're coming from and we can find that solution that we're looking for. So in the end, when you establish that base of communication, then you can go forward with other things because then you're not holding on to, you know, something else, some past grievance, some resentment. Uh, um, you you know that you've been heard now. You know it's time to move on. It's time to think about your kids. You know, get past that. Not saying that you're going to get past the feelings. You know, but but as far as like in our negotiations, in our mediation, in our co-parenting coaching, it's time to move on in that sense. If there's still a further kind of you know feeling about that and this and that, I'm a big supporter of mental wellness, getting therapy, counseling, getting that successful toolkit so that you can successfully manage those feelings. And over time, overcome them and know, hey, what's hurting me? What can I do to do this? So you can be a better person, really. And then by being a better person, you can be a better co-parent and, and you know, for, and hopefully a better parent to your children. Oh, my goodness. You are so good. <laughs> I hope people call you for your mediation services because you are. You're so good. And um, also, I have a video uh, if you want to look up. Um, I'll find out what episode it is, but it's um, how to apologize. And that is 
I mean, most of us are not ready for that. But when you are ready, that's a great video. I take you through how to actually conduct a, an apology there. And I mentioned that because, I mean, oh my gosh, this situation, it is, it's emotionally charged in all levels, right? It doesn't matter if your ex has moved on and that's what has gotten you emotionally charged or that they're still in it. And that's what's gotten you emotionally charged. Everything about this is emotional, which brings up all of this. It brings out the bad sometimes in us, right? It just does. I was not the person that I wanted to be right after my divorce. Not even close. I'm, I'm ashamed of actually that woman that I was. And I have to claim her now because I had to grow away from that. But I can say I was not me and that is not who I wanted to be. And it, I was ugly. I didn't like it. Um, and it was because of all that emotion. So one of the things that um, this video kind of triggered in me was it, it, it's to notice those triggers. What are those patterns that make me turn to the dark side of my the co-parent that I don't want to be? What made me do that? Is it jealousy? Is it that I'm just so emotionally charged? that? Um, and for me, I was left. My husband left me. So I was very emotional. You know, is it just uh, the feelings of loss? Like, what is it? And I think it's really important for parents to figure out so that they don't end up like the video. You know, what are your triggers in being a co-parent? And if sometimes those triggers are just your kids leaving the other stuff at the ex's house, or you feeling like you have to buy everything because your ex is not buying their half of whatever they need to buy. But one thing I found through my divorce process and my personal growth is in order for me to get to a good place, I had to eat shit. And I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. That's why I'm going to even say that word because I had to accept that I was going to eat shit and I was going to eat shit often, but I needed to eat shit so that I could be the better person in my eyes and what it really needed to be is be the better person that I wanted to be instead of that ugly Christina that I was when I first got divorced. And I had to literally make my way through the shit. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. To, to elevate myself to become the better person I was. And I don't think that many parents want to eat shit. I think many parents, the majority of them, feel like they have the right for everything to be equal. I pay, you pay, half time, blah, blah, blah. And I, it just it, it came to me very quickly that half of everything was not in the best interest of my children. And so I had to learn and eat shit. I hope that makes sense, Rodrigo. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I appreciate you being real about it. And not sugarcoating it because it really is you having to wade through, you, you know, things that you're not going to be comfortable with. Um, you know, when, when when I went through my separation, you know, I, I, I wasn't comfortable with what was going on. And when I found out that Samuel was coming along, you know, that, that you know, uh, his mom and I, we got together pretty quick. And I realized I, I was going through, you know, like, wow, what am I going to do here? This, this and that. And then we broke up. So like you said, you know, now I'm going through this period where I didn't want, you know, I wanted to go out. I wanted to do this, do that. But I did. I did have to eat shit. I had to go through that hard period and really figure out like, hey, what am I doing? What What's going on with my life? Because if I didn't do that, I know that I wouldn't become a good, I wouldn't be a good person and I wouldn't be a good dad. You know, it's it's super hard to be a good dad if you're a bad person. It, it really is. You know, you, you're going to you're going to show those bad traits, that trauma, that, those experiences that you haven't worked out, that you haven't resolved. And so it's really important that we go through those journeys, that we do eat shit, as you succinctly put it, because if we don't, then we're missing part of that healing process. Uh, I have I have one client right now that I'm working with and, and I want to tell her, I, I want to tell her like, Hey, slow down. 
you know, it's it's it, you know, the, it's a process, but you got to slow down. But it's not really my my place to say that. You know, I'm I'm a mediator. I'm not here to like. I, I hate to say not to be friends. We end up becoming friendly most of the time, right? Uh, uh, with the folks that I work with. But at the same time, I have to know, like, hey, I can't be protecting every single person, you know. And if this person chooses to do what they're doing, you know, you know, it's it's on them, you know. And if they ask me, you know, then yeah, I'll probably provide some advice and go, like, hey, slow down a bit, you know, like, hey, we gotta, you got, you gotta heal. Ba- basically, what I'm trying to say is like this person hasn't healed, or at least my perception is that they haven't healed. Now, I'm not a licensed professional counselor, so I can't make those assessments and those judgments, right? But I've been through my own healing journey. I've been through my own mental wellness journey that I can recognize that. I can recognize when somebody hasn't healed, they're putting that that facade, right? They're like, oh, man, I'm tough and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I don't give a shit. And we're going to do this. And I'm living my best life. But they haven't healed. And when you walk around with that pain, you know, when you walk around with that trauma, that, that healing hasn't happened, it's bound to come up. It's bound to a pop up somewhere where you least expect it and probably where you don't want it to pop up. So I'm glad that you put it that way, Christina. It totally makes sense. And I think folks need to understand that that is part of the process. You know, if if you are going through a separation, if you are going through, you know, this co-parenting journey and it's hard, that's kind of part of the process, but you got to start. But the first thing is recognizing that if you recognize that, then you can start kind of making those inroads towards healing and then start the communication path and then start becoming better co-parents for the sake of your kids. And power dynamics, control issues. These are the other things I see causing these kinds of conflicts like the uh, like the video. You know, it's it's that control, wanting to have control. So, yes, I'm going to no, no, no. Those are the ones that I bought for my house. You can't take that over there. You know, so. I'm curious with your practice, what kind of power struggles do you see most often with co-parents and how do you resolve those? Many times I see there's an income disparity, right? Where one parent is making more money than the other. Um, And and it goes both ways. There's sometimes I've had clients where, uh, um, you know, one parent, um, the mom has a great job. And the dad doesn't. And but the dad has the, you know, the the child support he has to pay through and this and that. And so there is kind of a power dynamic there, you know, and, and so so the guy's thinking like, oh man, I barely make this much, and she makes this much, or this and that, right? But it's an obligation, you know. And and so what I try to help out with clients is making them understand, like, hey, the harder you make it for your other parent, you know, the harder it becomes for their, their relationship with their kids as well. You know, that that particular case. Uh, we, we it, it was a co-parenting coaching. I helped them out. It worked great. But at the very beginning, especially, you know, she, she was really hammering him, really getting on him like, hey, you need to do this and you need to do that. And he was struggling. He, w- he was barely afloat, barely breathing, per se. Um, and then he was in a relationship and the whole time he was hiding it, you know, because she had a problem with that and this and that. Eventually, we got to the point where we disclosed everything. They both shared what they were going through and so forth. And when he disclosed that he was in a relationship, it suddenly changed. You know, she had this power dynamic where like, hey, I'm making more money than him, this and that. But now she's like, oh, snap, he's in a relationship. I'm not. Did he already move on? You know, it just completely, you know, and he had done a really well, good job of changing that. So that was kind of a shift in the power in the sense of like, she felt she had control over things, but all of a sudden she felt like she didn't have control. And so when he shared that, they opened up. She realized like, okay, you know, all right. And she became a lot, uh, I, I would I would characterize it as softer, you know, and, and, and so forth. And, and but at, at the end, she began to empathize, you know, and, and she began to understand that. And, you know, she shared with me later on that like, you know, I've been interested in this guy, but I was so wrapped up in what's going on here. I didn't even pay attention to that guy. I didn't want to go out and this and that. And I told her, like, you're entitled to your happiness. I don't know. You know, nobody, you know, nobody's bound to their kid's relationship. You know, you have kids. You know, I I hear this all the time, too, talking about power dynamics, that folks say, like, I live for my kids, you know, and I 
you know, I do everything for my kids. And that, that's a great sentiment, but honestly, that's not good. That's not what you should do because eventually your kids move on and then you're going to be left with nothing. You know, when you're a happy person, you're going to be a happy parent. And so I think it's really important that you do that. And, and, and you can't really be happy if you're over here exerting a power dynamic with somebody, because that means that you're exerting, you know, an influence and usually it's a negative influence. So those are the kind of power dynamics that I've seen, you know, income. I've also seen relationship power dynamics where, you know, the, the, the children, one child likes the other parent more than the other or, or things of that nature or, or you, you know, dynamics that involve relationships outside. And so it's really, really important to, to understand that. But it's also important to recognize that and that, you know, if you want to have a successful co-parenting relationship, that, you know, power dynamics and, 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 and understanding the hierarchies and all this other stuff really needs to go out the door. It really you really don't have room for that. You have room for compassion, compromise in character, you know, making sure that we, you know, act in a way that our kids are going to be proud of. So I think it's super important that we recognize that. But Rodrigo, that's so hard. That's so hard. You make it sound so easy. Oh, there's no room for that. Oh my gosh. It's all emotional charge, right? So <clears throat> the power dynamic and letting that go. Ah, I mean, I just, I empathize with everybody out there. That is tough. It's, it's hard to eat shit. <laughs> it totally is. And that's one of the areas I could um, especially empathize with the money uh, power dynamic that you're talking about because my ex-husband is exponentially richer than me. And so um, because of that, I knew when we got our divorce that he was always going to have more, be able to give our kids more, do more with them. And I was immediately knew that I was going to get triggered by that. So going back to try and identify what triggers us to get into the bad version of us in this in divorce. And I knew that was one of them for me, that it was that power dynamic of him having so much more that I could never get that that level of income. It hurt my soul inside to know I couldn't go on these lavish vacations and take my kids and have those experiences with my children the way he could. And I hate to say it like that, but it is true. I was freaking jealous, downright I, jealous. But 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 didn't you? I mean, I mean, I don't want to disclose anything personal. Yeah. But didn't you make that kind of a a caveat that you take a trip every year? I did. Well, actually, that was his choice. Yeah. So, it, like I said, my divorce is completely non traditional. And one of the things that my ex husband initiated in our divorce agreement was that we did a once a year vacation all six of us we have four children together because i was married for 13 years and just the two parents it's even written in the divorce agreement no spouses no boyfriends no girlfriends no nothing like just the six of us and um i really thought that was great because it did help me he doesn't know that uh but he did it because he thought it would be nice for our young children at the time who were were babies to have their parents one week a year together. I commend him for that. For me, it was great because it took off a little bit of that pressure of what are they doing? I'm missing out. That big FOMO I was having of I can't do that with my kids the way he can. At least this one vacation a year, I got to be with them and I got to experience that with them. And I'm, I mean, we're still doing it to this day. I leave in next week to uh, this vacation with, with him. And so, um, and I still look forward to it, but it, it was something that I had to really identify and work on from the beginning to say, it's okay that he can go and do all of that. And I, I can figure out special moments in a different way, but that was hard. I mean, it really was difficult to get over that power dynamic. And it still bothers me to this day, if I'm honest with myself, on occasion, it still creeps up. And I still work on that. I, I mean, I want to buy my kids the brand new shiny car the way that he can, or say I paid for their college the way he can, you know, but I can't. <laughs> so 
I let him do that and that's okay. And he gets to have that credit and you know what? He deserves it. He was able to do it, I guess. But, but, but I think, I think that's, that's part of the, the initial conversation, whether you came up with that or he came up with that. I think that's great communication on both of y'all's parts. And like, Hey, we should do this for our kids. And, and, um, and I'm not going to speak for you as to the trips that y'all have taken, but I have to think that these trips have been beneficial to your kids that they've, you know, that they've grown up, you know, going to different places around the world, experiencing things, but also with both of y'all. And I assume I'm pretty sure it was hard at the beginning, especially, but I assume now that there's like a level of communication that's pretty, pretty, pretty nice, pretty gentle, pretty, you know, at the very least cordial. Is that okay to describe that communication while y'all are on the trips? Absolutely. But I'm 10 years out from my divorce, I would say. And so I think that's important to note, like, Hey, it's a, again, going back to process. Like it wasn't always like that 10 years late. And these vacations were not always easy. They were, they were extremely difficult. I would run and hide all by myself and cry in the middle of vacations sometimes. And nobody knows that. I think that's the first time I've ever even said that out loud because I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want my ex, certainly my ex-husband to know that I would, you know, in the middle and I will go outside and cry by myself. For sure. My kids, no way. There's no way I don't want them to know that I was sad at all during those vacations. But, um, but man, they were great. And it was a great idea. Um, there's many, many, many exponential more benefits from that than from my ex-husband and I getting along having one week with our kids alone, having that experience with them, than it is any negative. But uh, you do eat a lot of shit on those vacations too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I think, and I think that's a testament to what we've been talking about, right? It's a growth. It's a process. It's not something that happens overnight, especially if there's emotional, uh, um, there's an emotional uh, disconnect there, you know, we're both, you know, y'all are on different levels and this and that, but it's taking time. And now you're to a place where, you know, Hey, you know what? I'm comfortable even admitting something that I haven't admitted ever before that, you know, it was tough at the beginning, but now you have these memorable chips. You're going on another trip pretty soon. Uh, I think this is kind of a great example that parents can really look up to and say like, you know what? I'm going through a really tough process right now. And and it doesn't look good, but you know, in the long term, if I follow these steps, if I just take the time to really process and heal, that I can get to a stage where I'm like Christina, and I can take trips and be around the person and not have a blowout or so. Uh, yeah. So that's great. I, I think I think that's great, Christina. Uh, certainly, you've reached a level that's even higher than I've reached because I know that I would never take a trip. <laughs> <laughs> with, with 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 one of them <laughs> and the other one i don't think she would want to take a trip with me anyway so, so, so yes so oh good. when i tell yeah. people about it they're always like uh what <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but it, it does it does definitely take a lot of personal resolve and healing that you've done uh throughout it right it's it's you know we don't operate in a vacuum where like one day it just happens, you know, it's, it's a journey, it's a process. And it sounds like you've been able to manage that process now. And, and uh, I commend you for that. That's amazing. Thank you. And you know, that's a one trigger. Like I said, that power dynamic is only one trigger. You got to identify all these triggers that make you go into that dark place. As soon as my ex you mentioned have a relationship, that is a trigger for nearly everybody. I don't know how you felt about it when your exes, you know, decided to finally date or moved on. But oh my goodness, for me, it was, of course, I was left. So it's a little bit different of a situation than being on the other side of that, but huge trigger. And because of that, then all the emotions come up, they start to boil. And all of a sudden, here I am saying, I paid for that, bring it back over to my house. (laughs) You know, like, you know, you start going to that unrational bickering again. And so to identify that these are your triggers, um, another trigger actually, and then I think about it is 
having unrealistic expectations of your ex. And this goes both ways. When they have unrealistic expectations of you and you have unrealistic expectations of them. For And the reason I'm bringing this up is because as I'm thinking about the bad Christina inside, when I was in the bickering mode, like the video and saying half, half, everything equal, that was so much of an unrealistic expectation I had on my ex-husband. He was never that dad. When Even when we were married, he was never taking care of the kids half of the time. No way. Why would it be that as soon as I got a divorce, I would think that now you are responsible for the kids half of the time. Take them away. Good luck. And, and then expect him to be able to do it well. Remember everything. Uh, be the parent I want him to be. Those are unrealistic expectations that came out of ugly triggering Christina that I think a lot of people don't, especially women, we put on our exes. And I think on the other hand, there's, I'm sure you have examples of how men often do the same type of thing with the, with the woman. And I just want to say, Hey, I'm saying it. I'm bringing that out loud. Why would we expect that of our ex? And we're just setting them up for failure. And when we set them up for failure, not only are they going to get disappointed, it's going to cause an argument. It's going to trigger us some more. It's not good for our kids. Rodrigo, stupid. Why are we doing that? I think it boils down to, to us being insecure. And so what we do is we end up exerting that insecurity onto somebody else, hoping that they also feel insecure. So in other words, like when you were talking about Hey, you know, I'm 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 a homemaker. I take care of the kids and this, this and that. You're really good at that. You you probably you know and you 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 are, but you probably think like, hey, that's my strong suit, right? Maybe I don't make as much money as he does, but he I definitely can take care of the kids. So what do you do? You end up exerting those same standards that you have for yourself onto him, knowing that he doesn't have those standards, knowing that he he's going to fall short. But it makes you feel better in a certain type of way because he can criticize him for that. Right. You can't criticize him for the lack of money he's making. I'm, I'm sure he's paying his child support. He's taking care of his kids and so forth. You can't, you know, maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe he's good at something else. You don't want to criticize him for that. But you'll definitely pick on what he's not good at. Right. And that, that your example right there is definitely not uh, uh, isolated. There are tons of relationships and co-parenting journeys that I've worked with definitely fall in that paradigm where, like the mom has been taking care of a lot of things and taking the kids to school with this and that. And dad's been going to work and, you know, occasionally he dabbles here and there. Now all of a sudden, you know, he, he goes, he's supposed to pick up the kids and drop them off at school and she's mad because they're like 10 minutes late and this and that. Da, da, da. And I have to remind them, I was like, yeah, he's, he's, he's got to take time to do that. You've been doing this now for uh, eight years, right? I'm just throwing a number. You've been doing this now for eight years. You have it down packed. You know, he's been doing this now for eight weeks. He's still learning. He's still growing. That same grace, though, needs to be extended to the other party as well. I've had folks, you know, tell me, you know, folks, uh, uh, men who tell me like, oh, yeah, she doesn't do this and she doesn't do that. And mom lets um, uh, her their daughter have an Instagram account. And no, 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 no. You know, and I say, no, 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 no. I said, okay, understood. Y'all haven't compromised on that. So for now, she has an Instagram account. You know, now if she's gonna, if she's gonna police it, she told you that she's gonna police it and make sure she does, then then what else do you want? You know, well, no, I don't have an Instagram account. And I go, understood, you know, but that doesn't mean that you know in her house is gonna be a different set of rules, you know. Unless y'all can compromise on that, you're just gonna have to deal with that, you know. His that he was trying to apply his standards where he doesn't have a social media life to her, to her, to their daughter, but also by default, by de facto to her, because she did have a social media life. And he, he was like, Oh no, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Again, implementing those standards on somebody else is not, you know, going to work because they have different standards. They have different ways. The only time I agree with that is like in safety, you know, when in security, I get that, you know, but even that, can be misconstrued. You know, I've, I've had parents, you know, kind of criticize the partner of their other co-parent 
and say like, oh, well, this person, this and this person, that. And, you know, uh, what kind of he, he works at that? Oh, come on. What kind of job is that? You know, this trying to basically, you know, uh, diminish that person, you know, it, it, you know, and I always tell parents like, hey, you trusted this person to have a daughter with you or you know, son or whatnot. Now, all of a sudden, you don't trust them to like have another partner. You know, they, you know, it, it's it's a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of things I got to get worked through. But definitely, I, I feel that when, when it comes to those kind of dynamics, that we need to be cognizant of what we're saying and what we're doing because our standards does not apply to everybody. You know, and we got to be careful with that because that is kind of a uh, a a signal that maybe we need a little bit more healing to do. And then one last thing, Christina, you mentioned triggers. You know, when, when I went through my mental health journey, I realized what my triggers were, you know, and I figured them out and I said, okay, whenever this happens, this is what I'm going to do. Whenever this happens, this is what I'm going to do. I have a toolkit and I use my toolkit whenever something happens that I need a process. And I think that's super, super important that people realize what their triggers are and what to do about those triggers when they happen. Too many times we don't even identify the triggers or we know what the triggers are, but we don't do anything about it or we have a terrible response towards it. One of those things that I always encourage people to do when it goes to counseling and therapy is developing a toolbox to know how to handle those triggers. So, for example, and I'll end right here. One trigger for me, right, was communication, like like any type of communication that wasn't preceded with kindness. I always felt like that was a trigger. It took me back to a, a moment back when I was younger, a younger dad, and that just brought a lot of pain. So now, and it doesn't happen now, but, you know, a few years ago when I was still in my co-parenting journey with uh, Rodrigo's mom, if ever there was a, a text that started off with, a command or something like that, I would just ignore it. And I would type back, hey, can you rephrase that? And I know it sounds stupid. I know, it's, but I explained it one time, you know, and I just said like, hey, look, when you talk like this to me, this is what's going to happen or this and that. So when I just type back to you and say, can you rephrase that for me, please? I'm asking for some kindness. I'm asking for some grace. If you're not there, then don't even respond to it. But if we're here to talk about my son and this and that, I want to have kind communication. It didn't work. It didn't. No, no. <laughs> it didn't work. At least you but tried, I, though. You did try to communicate with I her. did. Exactly. Exactly. I, I remain level-headed about it. And there were times when it worked. I mean, it happened here and there. But it didn't work. But I knew I was setting the terms of like, hey, our communication, what needs to happen? And, and that's what happened. And now I feel comfortable that, hey, every time I communicate it, I did it in a place that was in a good spot. I was thinking about my son and I was only thinking about good, positive, even kind communication. I wasn't trying to be petty or anything like that. So if anything I got out of that was it helped me refocus myself as well and make sure that I was at a good state, that I didn't respond unkindly or that I didn't respond with my first reaction, with my trigger reaction, right? Like, you know, Responding like, like, hey, what the fuck kind of text is this? You know, or something like that, you know? No, 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 chill. Hey, let's rephrase it. If you're not cool with it, then don't rephrase it. I just won't respond to it. I am so grateful that you talk about your mental health journey so candidly because more men need to do that. Like there's yes. a, there's a stigma on, stigma on it and I don't like that. And I mean, I just see the man you are today and I mean, I'm proud of you and I don't even know you for, you know, but the last four years or so, I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine the Rodrigo, the, that dark Rodrigo that I talked, like you wouldn't recognize the dark Christina either, but it, I see this man in front of me and I'm like, yes, yes, I, more men need to do it. And through my journey, when I got divorced, I do want to mention that legally, the divorce is 50 50. Through that process of me going through my healing and him growing and us just figuring our shit out, you know, it's not 50 50 anymore. So, and I want to just put that out there so that people can say it's okay that things aren't 50 50 anymore. We found our balance 
And if you can get past all these triggers that you're going to have and eventually grow into it, to this day, we're not 50-50 and it works great for our family. I have the kids uh, like 90% of the time, like literally I'm like just the primary caregiver. And I've decided to just lean into that role. He has decided to lean into what he does best, being the provider. So he pays for most of the kids' stuff. I mean, not I know most. I'm going to say all. He is an amazing provider. And I'm an amazing caregiver. We decided to finally let go of that petty difference and actually lean into our strengths. And it has been great for our children. Do we still have differences? Yeah, we do. Do we still argue and have all, like, yes, but we try to do it behind the curtain, <laughs> you know? And I just wanted to mention that so parents know that it's okay not to be 50-50. Do whatever is best for your family. And if that's you taking the kids 90% of the time, maybe you're just that good of a parent that they need to be with you 90% of the time. How great is that? It's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, lean in. It's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that because it took me a while to get there, but I'm really happy that I did. Yeah. yeah. I got to applaud that, Christina, because as a, I, I'm an equity based mediator, uh, the mediation, that, the training that I received was from Manuso's Mediation Training Academy in Houston, Texas. And we specifically train. Uh, we were specifically trained not to do 50-50. Only do 50-50 if that's what makes sense. But more equity-based where, hey, wh what what are we trying to really get to and who's better at what? You know, what do you what's really important to you? And so sometimes the agreements that I make as an as a mediator are not 50-50. They're 70-30 or they're, you know, this and that. But that's what works in that case. And I apply that same philosophy into my co-parenting uh, uh, consultancy. Because it's the same thing. I mean, what you just said right now is 100% spot on. And I wish more parents, co-parents, would really respond positively to that and understand, like, hey, maybe I'm better at this. Maybe I'm the better planner, you know, and, and this other person is the better provider or this other person is the better disciplinarian even, you know, the better, you know, whatever the roles are, whatever y'all agree to. It doesn't always have to be 50-50. And I'm glad that you've reached that stage, but I'm also glad that you can use that as an example of what good parenting looks like. And I want to end with talking a little bit about you and mediation, because as people are listening to this, that they're identifying with what we're saying and that video, they might need mediation. I don't think people really understand what mediation is and what they get out of it. Like, what is that in comparison to like, I'm going to take you to court so that we can make things 50-50. Like, what is mediation? Can you tell me a little bit about that for the audience? And like, what, what do you do? What do you get out of it? Why should I go? Yeah, no, mediation is basically a, uh, an ADR, an alternative dispute resolution where parties meet together and try to come up with the best agreement for them. Um, where lawyers are really advocating for their party, right? They're trying to get everything that they can, what they feel their party needs and so forth. Mediators like myself, we really advocate for the best solution for both parties. We don't advocate for either one. What we're trying to do is find the solution that already exists within both parties. And I'm going to um, clarify something while you're talking about this. So with uh, you're going to a lawyer, you have a lawyer and he has a lawyer. But with mediation, you have one person representing. Both yeah, yeah. It can be it can be two mediators as well. But typically, like, for example, the way I work with I only do uh, it's only me mediating. I'm not trying to mediate with another mediator or anything like that. But, yes, it's one mediator listening to the parties involved and really trying to get the solution from those parties. You know, uh, I don't want to. Uh, now, there is another form of ADR card arbitration where both parties talk to a mediator, arbitrator, really, like myself. They give the facts. They say this, this and that. And then I decide what the best solution is. But I don't particularly agree with that with that type of ADR. I'm more of a mediator where I find out what people's needs are, what their wants are, what's what's necessary, their requirements. But also delve a little bit into the feelings behind that. And trying to figure out what's really the trigger in there. I would say about 90% of my cases are really emotionally driven. Uh, whether it's child custody, uh, civil cases, 
divorce, uh, elder care, et cetera. It, it, it really is. It really is different when you're looking for a solution that benefits everybody, not just a solution for one person. Uh, mediation works in pretty much any type of case. Uh, I don't do heavy asset mediation uh, with divorces and so forth. I just feel like those are much more better suited for somebody like a lawyer that does discovery, that goes through the proper procedures of finding all the assets. So, for example, like mutual funds and, you know, big real estate, stuff like that. I, I try to stay away from it just because, A, I don't have much experience in it. But also, B, I feel like those are the types that maybe does need a little bit more peering into. I've had examples for me personally where I find out that the party has more assets than they're claiming. And I have to re- I basically have to recuse myself. I say, like, hey, I can no longer fairly mediate this because there's something that I know that I can't express, you know, and I say, hey, you need to litigate this. But mediation for uh, smaller cases, medium cases like divorce, child custody, uh, uh, elder care, uh, things of that nature I've done. And it's really, I feel, a great way to resolve disputes if you're having trouble with a litigation or if you haven't even started litigation. I really recommend folks go through that first because you can really save not only a lot of time, but a lot of money as well going through mediation and going through a solution, an equity based solution that really takes into effect everybody's real needs and real necessities from the dispute that they're having. So th- that's the mediation that I do, the type of work that I've done. And I'm really happy with it. I, I really, I, I really use that as well as the basis of my co-parenting coaching and consultancy. I, 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 drew, I niche down even further into that because I was a mediator and because I have that experience as a co-parent on both spectrums, both on a very positive relationship uh, with, that I had with Samuel's mom, Maribel, and with a not so positive relationship with Rodrigo's mom. And so using that experience as a co-parent, somebody that, you know, like myself, that I'm BIPOC and can represent, you know, uh, uh, black and brown communities. I really try to help parents in those communities in mediation and co-parenting to to really kind of establish like a trust and say, hey, you know what? You're going through this. I, I'm someone that maybe you can trust and that we can work on this together. I may have the same background that you do. Uh, and I understand where you're coming from because I've been there myself. So, yeah, that's a little bit about mediation and also the co-parenting coaching, coaching that I do. And you can do mediation anytime. So, like, let's say me and my ex-husband, we've been divorced almost 10 years now. But if we had an argument, we can still go to a mediator, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, you can go to a mediator uh, for, for really anything. Anything that you feel like needs to be resolved. It could be something small, something big doesn't really matter, you know, uh, 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 and it also could be an addition to an agreement you already have, you know, uh, uh, sometimes there's been parents, I've had this maybe twice, I think, uh, maybe three times where where they have a divorce decree, but something has changed, but they don't want to go through the entire divorce decree and change this and change that. So what they'll do is they'll do an addendum to it and add the MAS to it. I'm sorry, the mediation agreement settlement. That, that's the standard document that we have. They'll add that on, tack it on. We'll file it with the with the county where the decree was done. And that's it. It's just like a legal form. It's just like a legal document. It gets tacked on and it adds to the decree. In that case, it was just a revision of the uh, visitation rights. Uh, their visitation rights were never discussed past 100 miles. And so when one parent moved, they were going to have to file a whole nother decree and do this and that. I said, no, we can mediate that. I, we can mediate that. Let's agree to the terms and this and that. It was pretty, it was really simple. Both the parents were very happy. They just wanted to lock it down. They wanted to make sure they had something to go on. And, and in fact, that that's a great uh, ending right there. That was one of the person's triggers. Um, I can't remember if it was her or him, but one of them had a trigger that if things weren't like, you know, detailed and spelled out, 
that it would cause chaos and confusion with them and their their co-parenting partner. And they they had examples of that. So he, he I can't remember which one it was, but they both recognized the need to do that, that they needed to have everything in paper. That way, if there ever was a, a, a disagreement, they could just say, hey, look, you know what? Let's just go back to the decree. You know, that's kind of how they settled their their disagreements or arguments. So a full circle moment there, because that, that was one way that they discovered their triggers so that they can avoid all that pity, pettiness and tit for tat that some parents do like in that video. Even though it was a skit, we know it's real because when you read the comments, you see all the people that are agreeing with it and saying that, like, you know what? I need that shirt back. Yep. <laughs> Crazy. Bring it back to my house. Wait, that wait. belongs here. I paid for it. I want those shoes clean. Mm -hmm. in, in Colorado, we get a lot of, I bought all the ski gear. No, you can't take them with it. Because <laughs> it's really expensive to buy ski That's gear. That's expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so they're like, no, you can't take it over to his house and leave it over there or whatever that looks like, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it, they're, yeah, yeah. it's real. They're real arguments. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rodrigo, for joining me with me today. That was an awesome conversation. I just wanted to say, you guys, check out those triggers. Find them. If you feel a ton of emotion coming out from your body, that's probably a trigger. Like, start looking for it and digging down. Check out your mental health journey. There's no shame in it. It will make you the best person, the best version of yourself that you that you know you can, can be and want to be. So, Go and go that direction. And don't forget to uh, come back next week when Rodrigo and I will be back. Start your Impactful Parent journey by downloading the Impactful Parent app. The Impactful Parent app is free to carry help, tips, and parenting resources right in your pocket. Download the app today. You got nothing to lose. It's a free download. So go to theimpactfulparent.com or your phone's app store and discover how you can step up your parenting game and become a more impactful parent. And if you would like to reach out to Rodrigo Bravo for his co-parenting mediation and coaching services, you can email him at RodrigoBravoJr at gmail.com. Remember that this episode is just a small part of what the Impactful Parent offers. Also available are online courses, parent support groups, coaching services, and the Impactful Parent app. Find out more at TheImpactfulParent.com. But until next time, you got this. I'm just here to help. Thank you for listening today. Remember to subscribe and share this podcast with a friend. And don't forget, the Impactful Parenting Podcast is an extension of the Impactful Parent community. Go to the Impactful Parent website and download the free Impactful Parent app so you don't miss a parenting tip that can help you and your family. Thanks for listening today. So go to theimpactfulparent.com and see you next episode.